Chapter 11 of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 11, Gypsy's Voyage. For a day or two, the ship remained at the pier loading. All day long men were rolling and carrying and hauling things up the gangplank, and stowing them away in the great dark hold of the vessel. The sailors, too, were working hard, and did not have any time to give to the dog. As for Gypsy himself, he was so well pleased with his good luck in getting aboard a steamer that was to sail so soon, that he devoted himself only to resting and keeping out of the way. Besides, he was tired by his long tramp about the city, after he had passed his time so quietly in Chris and Helen's house, and now he was glad to keep quiet once more. At first he found himself a good deal in the way. No sooner did he pick out a nice place for a nap than someone would come and roust him out of it. He was too much of a landlubber to know which parts of the deck were likely to be undisturbed, and it was not until late in the second day that he found out that by going far forward into the bow he would be where nobody came. Jack, the French sailor, was very kind to Gypsy when he had time, and took care that the little dog had two good meals every day, and that there was a tin of fresh water within his reach. But except for a kind word in passing, and a pat on the head now and then, he was too busy to pay any attention to Gypsy. On the third day the cargo was all in, and at last the ropes were cast off, a sturdy little tug was attached, and the steamer was hauled out into the river and towed out to the harbour. Gypsy was still kept busy avoiding the trampling feet and tumbling packages, and had no time to notice anything. He knew that they had begun the voyage, and that was all he cared about just then. And when they finally were in blue water, and the waves began to toss the vessel about, Gypsy found out what Jack had meant by several joking remarks about getting his sea legs on. He could not at first keep his footing, and once or twice went rolling over the deck, until he came whack against the bulwarks. Besides, Gypsy did not feel at all well. He did not enjoy his meals, and in fact ceased to eat anything for the first day or two at sea. He was seasick, and so miserable that he began to wonder if he hadn't made a mistake in trying to cross the ocean. The voyage from Europe in the big passenger steamer had not made him sick at all, but this little boat bobbed about in a manner very different from the long, slow roll of the enormous ocean racer. Gypsy was cured of his seasickness in a curious way. One of the sailors, the same one that had been mending his clothes when Gypsy came aboard, was a mischievous fellow, and like other lovers of mischief, thoughtless of the suffering his jokes caused. Seeing Gypsy moving mournfully about the deck, he said, This will never make you a sailor, pup. Do you know how we make sailors out of green hands? We send them aloft. That's the best cure for seasickness. Then, seeing that Sailor Jack was not on deck, he caught Gypsy up and jumped into the rigging. Even if the dog had known what the sailor was going to do with him, he could not have run away. And indeed, Gypsy did not much care just then. Up and up climbed the sailor, holding Gypsy tight with one arm, and climbing with the other. Higher and higher he went, until he came at last to the very top of the mast, where there is a flat, round place called the truck. Then, reaching up, the sailor put the dog there, and slid down, leaving the poor little landlubber to crouch down and hold on as well as he could. Scared? Gypsy was scared out of his seasickness. He crouched tight down, and, getting his paws over the edges, held on for his life. Meanwhile, Jack had come on deck just in time to see the other sailor coming down, and looking up, he spied Gypsy clinging to the truck. Jack thought the little dog could hold on for a few minutes at least, and slipping quietly below, he waited quietly with a rope's end until the mischievous sailor came within reach and then began to dust his jacket for him. Jack gave the scamp a good thrashing and then, dropping the rope, climbed the mask and took Gypsy safely down. The other sailor was angry, but the rest of the crew told him he deserved all he got, and so nothing more came of the squabble, except that Gypsy found his seasickness was entirely cured and from that day began to enjoy his life at sea. The weather was fine, the winds and waves quiet, and the steamer ploughed her way day after day 
without much to remember or to tell. Gypsy and Jack became excellent friends and good companions. When Jack was on deck during a night watch, Gypsy would stay beside him or walk with him. When they were below, Jack tried, after the manner of sailors, to teach his pet some tricks. Of course, Gypsy knew all the common tricks, but he thought it wiser to let Jack have the pleasure of teaching them over again. And in that way, too, Gypsy had many a reward for his cleverness in learning tricks he had already learned long ago. There was one thing Gypsy didn't like at all. They sometimes put him into the hold to kill rats. And these fellows were so big and so fierce that it was no easy matter to deal with them. But Gypsy felt it was only right he should do some work in return for his passage and support, and did his part so well that the captain praised him, and told Jack that Gypsy was paying his way. Gypsy found out, too, that the fighting and hard work did him good, giving him plenty of exercise and improving his courage. Altogether, the voyage was making Gypsy over. He was bigger, stronger, braver, and more cheerful. He became a little more used to fun and good-humoured joking, the men had no other pet aboard, and so played many tricks on the dog, tricks that he took good-naturedly. Of course, no one ever suspected that Gypsy could talk, and he was glad of that. He was afraid that the sailors would never let him go if they knew all he could do, and if they found out he could understand what they said. So they sailed on, and the days passed by, until Gypsy began to find the voyage much longer than he had expected. He did not know or didn't remember just how long he had been at sea coming to America, but he felt sure, as time went on, that this voyage was much longer than that had been. Exactly how many days they had been at sea, Gypsy could not tell, when one day he heard the cry, Land ho! and was overjoyed to think that his long voyage was over. But unfortunately, Gypsy had made himself too well liked. The sailors were afraid they might lose him, and before they came near the harbour, Jack took Gypsy down below and shut him up in a kind of prison made of wooden bars. Jack came to see him every day and still looked after his comfort, but Gypsy was not let out. One day he whined and begged and made such a fuss that Jack felt sorry for him. Never mind, old fellow, said he soothingly. You don't want to get lost here in South America. Just wait until we get to Madagascar and then you'll have a run ashore like the rest of us. You may be sure this gave Gypsy something to think about. He didn't know much geography, it is true, but he understood that South America was part of America, and not in Europe. While, as for Madagascar, it was a place of which he had never heard. Gradually he began to see that he had been very stupid just when he had thought he was cleverest. He had thought a French sailor must be going to France, and had never done anything to find out where the steamer was bound. Now he was sure that they were going to some part of the world that was far away from where he had left his master, and what to do about it he didn't know. You may be sure that Gypsy did not have many happy hours in his prison, and even when the vessel was once more at sea and Gypsy was let out of his prison, he was in a doleful state of mind. End of chapter 11「Of Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry – Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks Chapter 12 – In a Strange Land Gypsy was on board what is called a tramp steamer that is, a steamer without a regular route. These vessels go wherever they can make money by delivering their cargoes. The one on which Gypsy had made his voyage was loaded with cotton goods, crockery, and many sorts of provisions in tin cans. Her owners expected to bring back in return India rubber, hides, and other products of the great island. The steamer had stopped at several South American ports on her way, but of these, as has already been told, Gypsy saw nothing being shut up in the hold for safekeeping. The little dog had understood from Jack that when they arrived at Madagascar, he would be allowed to go ashore, and he longed for a chance to leave the ship. They had sailed south continually, and the weather was very hot, but the crew bore it all patiently, because there had been no storms and nothing to cause them anxiety or hard work. After they had rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and were sailing northward, 
the crew felt certain of a lucky voyage. Everybody on board was good-natured, and only Gypsy seemed ever unhappy. He did his best, however, to bear his part in amusing the crew, and often went through his tricks for their pleasure, when he would rather have been grumbling and growling in some corner by himself. One night, when Jack was on the lookout forward, with Gypsy beside him, the sailor was too tired to keep awake, and before he realized how drowsy he was becoming, his eyes closed, his head drooped, and he was fast asleep. It may be that Gypsy himself was not entirely wide awake, but he was really excusable, for he was not on duty. At all events, suddenly Gypsy was wakened by the puffing of a steamer, and jumped to his feet to see a red light on the port bow, a light so near that Gypsy thought the two steamers would run each other down. There was no time to wake Jack. Gypsy had to act, and he called out as loud as he could, Red light on port bow! And then caught Jack's arm and shook him. The steersman heard the cry and steered to starboard. The two steamers passed each other altogether too near for comfort, but the danger was over. Jack woke as the other steamer passed, but he never knew who had given the warning. He did know that Gypsy had tried to wake him, and he was fonder of his pet than ever. This was the last adventure before the arrival in port at Tamatave, chief port of the great island of Madagascar. It was a happy little dog that trotted along up the sandy shore at Jack's heels on the day they first had liberty. The city where they had landed was situated upon hilly ground, surrounding a great stretch of sandy shore. Most of the houses were low, but a few were of several stories, and had high towers at the corners. Most of the people were dressed in white and went barefoot, but a few wore European dress. The natives seemed to be of many races, but the two principal ones were an olive-coloured, tall and fine-looking people, and a shorter, darker race of negroes with kinky black hair. Gypsy was wise enough to keep close to Sailor Jack. He had no wish to be lost in a strange land, where, for all Gypsy knew, small dogs were favourite articles of diet. Jack had never been in the town before, and wandered aimlessly about seeing the sights, and looking for a place where he might get a good meal, the first thing a sailor likes on getting ashore in a strange place. So they went through the streets, gazing at the queer people and the odd sights, until Jack caught sight of a sign reading, Café Foncé. It was oppressively hot, and the sailor was glad to get into a shady place where he could have a cool drink, and Gypsy gladly followed him. They found themselves in a small neat room, containing two or three wooden tables and chairs, and a few pictures of French generals. Jack dropped into a chair, and Gypsy coiled up under it and fell fast asleep, just as he heard Jack call the waiter and give his orders. When Gypsy awoke, it was pitch dark and perfectly still. He rose from the floor and bumped his head against a rung of the chair. Then he crawled out and moved cautiously about. Now said Gypsy to himself. I know just what has happened. That new master of mine has been drinking too much, like other sailors when they go ashore. Gypsy had learned a great deal of sailor life from the talks he had heard in the forecastle, And then he has just gone away, forgetting me altogether. It made cold chills run up and down Gypsy's back to find himself alone in this strange house, in a strange land, and in the black darkness. But he was braver than he used to be, and began at once to plan how he could get out of the scrape. Evidently, the first thing was to see where the door was, so Gypsy kept straight ahead, except for a table leg or two, and soon came to the wall. Then he kept close to the wall and began a slow circuit of the room, knowing that in this way he was sure to find the door. About halfway round he came to the door, but found it closed tight. No, said Gypsy, who had expected this, the next thing is to find a window and that is more of a puzzle. So he sat down and wondered how he should reach up high enough to be on a level with the windows. If there was only a row of chairs all the way round, he began, and then he thought that one chair would do, if only he pushed it around a little at a time. The chairs were light, and Gypsy, by standing on his hind legs, found he could easily move one of them. He pushed it to the wall, and standing up on it, felt with his nose each way as far as he could reach. Then he pushed it a little further, felt again, and so on. It was slow work, but sure, he told himself. After going about six feet, the chair hit against a table. 
Gypsy groaned, for he thought it would be a hard job to push the chair all around the table. Then he remembered suddenly that the table might be set against the window, and at once leaped to the top and felt about. To his joy, he discovered a window, and with very little trouble lifted the latch and threw the casement open. He was just about to jump out when he drew back quickly, reflecting that he didn't know where his leap in the dark would end. Again he sat down to solve this new puzzle, and in a moment had a happy thought. On the table there were a few dishes. Gypsy picked out the smallest and lightest, a butter plate, and dropped it out of the window. It fell only a short distance, as he could tell from the sound, and apparently upon soft ground. A dog must take some chances, said Gypsy, and leaped out. He came down on a garden bed among some flowers, unhurt and free. Now that he was outside, Gypsy could see better, though the sky was very cloudy. He was in a little garden surrounded by a sort of open-work fence, but so loosely put together that he had no trouble in squeezing himself through and into the street. Of course, he didn't know which way to go, but he did not have long to decide, for as he stood hesitating, there came a sudden rush, and a big dog, a watchdog, came over the fence with a fierce growl and a gritting of teeth. Gypsy did not stop to consider which was north, south, east or west. He didn't care much about which way he went, but he wished to go, and to go quickly. Away he went, doubled up like a bow, and then stretched out like a string, while right at his heels came the watchdog. Gypsy was just about to be overtaken when he saw at the side of the road a big packing box. He gave a leap into the air, thinking that he might make a fortress of it, and keep the big dog away for a few moments at least. But the box proved to be not only a fortress, but also a prison. There was a loose board on top of the box, fastened only at one end by some loose nails, and as Gypsy came down on the board it fell inward, letting him slide into the box, and then sprung upward, making him a prisoner. Meanwhile the big dog had not the slightest idea what had become of the little one. He had been just able to see him, and saw the leap toward the box, but could not see where Gypsy went afterward. He ran to the other side, then back again, sniffed about for a few minutes, and then gave up the chase, running back to the yard from which he had come, leaving poor Gypsy in his wooden prison. End of chapter 12「thirteen of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 13. What Gypsy Found. So long as the big watchdog was waiting outside, Gypsy had no wish to leave the box, but when the big dog was gone and all was quiet, Gypsy began to consider how he was to escape and get back to the ship. Try as he could, Gypsy was unable to climb up the smooth sides of the box. The loose board was too high for him to reach it, and there seemed nothing to do but to gnaw his way out. So he tried to make some impression on the boards, but it was useless, since they were too smooth inside to give him any hold and he could do no more than scratch a few tiny splinters from the sides. Having kept at this work until his short nose was sore, Gypsy gave up the attempt, and like a sensible little fellow, coiled himself up and resolved to wait patiently whatever might come. He was so very patient that he soon became drowsy, and then began to snore. In spite of his sleep that evening, Gypsy was soon lost in the land of dreams, dreaming of the country home of his puppydom, and of his street wanderings in Paris. It was broad daylight when he awoke, and as he did not quite come to his senses at first, he believed drowsily that he was again on shipboard, for the box was swaying gently to and fro and up and down. As Gypsy came broad awake, he remembered all that had happened, and knew that the box was being carried somewhere with a small dog inside. He very softly raised himself from the bottom of the box, and found a crack between the boards through which he could look out. Gypsy could not see much but the little he saw was enough to make it plain to him that the box was being carried on the shoulders of a tall, dark native who was climbing a mountain trail. Where he was going and how long he had been travelling already, Gypsy had not the faintest idea. He believed that he must have waked soon after the journey began, 
but he did not know. Not being acquainted with the native who was carrying him, Gypsy, of course, decided to keep quiet for the present, until he could get some idea of whether he would be petted or would be made into dog stew. But naturally it was not the happiest day of Gypsy's life. The journey went on until the sun was well overhead, and then the native stepped aside into the shadow of some trees, let the box drop from his shoulders, giving Gypsy a terrible bouncing, and lay down to rest. Gypsy was inclined to grumble at being tossed about in so rough a fashion, but when he recovered himself and looked about him, he found reason to be very glad of the tumbling. When he stood up in the box, he found that it had turned halfway over, so that what had been the top was now at the side. Gypsy knew that he could pull the loose board inward and escape as soon as the drowsy native should fall asleep. The open side of the box was away from the native, but through a crack on the other side, Gypsy saw the man's feet and knew he was lying down. He hoped the man would snore, for then he would not be afraid to steal out. So he patiently waited. In about ten minutes Gypsy heard the snoring sound, and very cautiously caught hold of the board, pulling it inward. It yielded readily, opened wide. Gypsy crawled softly out, and was free. At least he was out of the box and able to run about, but where to go was a puzzle. Of course he knew nothing about the country, and there was nothing in sight to guide him back to the town from which he had come. Yet, though his eyes could not serve him, he had another servant that proved more useful. He at once began by scent to trace the steps of the native down to the coast. Following the man's footsteps would bring him back to where the box had been. And then, thought Gypsy, I'll find Jack's tracks from the French restaurant back to the ship. And once back in the ship, the dog decided that he would try to get either to Paris or to America without caring much which, for he had convinced himself that he was not wise enough to go about the world alone. As he went trotting along as fast as he could follow the scent, Gypsy did a lot of thinking, and besides kept his eyes about him, for fear he might run into some party of natives. He was not afraid the native that carried the box would come after him, for he felt sure the man had not known he was inside. Gypsy saw many queer sights in the woods as he went along, Plenty of monkeys, for one thing. Monkeys that chattered at him, and threw branches or nuts at him as he passed. And he saw some snakes and queer-looking spiders. But he hurried on without giving these much thought. Suddenly, when Gypsy came to a cross-trail, he stopped and began sniffing the ground most searchingly. Then he threw his head upward, and then again began to smell about. He seemed very much excited, for his body quivered all over. At last, being alone in the woods... He spoke aloud to himself, something he had almost never done before. Well, he exclaimed, by the father of all the dogs that have barked at the moon, that scent was left by my old master's foot, or there's no trusting my nose any more. Again he went over the trail. It was somewhat confused, as if a large party of men had passed there, but Gypsy could not believe he had made a mistake in knowing the tracks were his old master's. It can't be possible, said Gypsy again. I'm surely dreaming. Here I am, I don't know how many miles away from France, and here is the scent of my old master's trail. It isn't possible, but all the same it's true. I can't always trust my mind, but I can always trust my nose. So here goes. I will follow his trail wherever it takes me. So saying, Gypsy at once left the path he had been following, and took up the new one. It led him directly to the bank of a river, and then followed a sort of rough highway among the rocks. All that afternoon Gypsy followed it, and just at nightfall it led him to a large encampment of soldiers. Although Gypsy did not know anything about it, there was fighting going on at that time between the French and the Malagasies, as the natives of Madagascar are called. And the trail he had been following was that of a body of French soldiers who had been sent to capture a native village. Had Gypsy known the soldiers were French, he would have entered the camp without fear, but now he made up his mind to go around the camping ground and look for the trail on the other side. That morning there had been a little skirmish between the French soldiers and the natives. It had been soon over, and the natives had run away, leaving their village to be destroyed by the troops, according to the orders of the French general. These orders had been carried out, and nothing but smoking ruins remained. There had been a sharp fight first, and one of the French soldiers, in pursuing some natives, had gone astray. When the natives were out of sight, and the soldier turned to rejoin his comrades, 
he could not find his way. This did not worry him at first, for he felt able to look out for himself until his comrades should find him. But presently he began to feel weak, without knowing the cause. Soon he found great difficulty in keeping his feet. So much had his weakness increased, and besides, he felt deathly sick. He sat down under a tree and leaned against the trunk. Then, looking down, he saw a slender arrow that hung by its barb in the side of his thigh. The wound it had made was very small, too small to have caused him any trouble, but the soldier knew that some of the natives still used poisoned arrows, which they blew through long wooden tubes. Then he was frightened, for he knew that unless the tiny wound was properly cared for, he had not long to live. Yet he could not walk far by himself, and he was afraid he might be abandoned by his comrades, who would think that he had fallen in their fight with the natives. He tied up the wound as well as he could, but he did not know how to treat it. He grew weaker, and at length lost his consciousness. He did not know how long he lay senseless, but he was awakened by a little dog, who was pulling at his arm. He opened his eyes drowsily, and the little dog capered around him joyfully. "'Don't you know me?' cried the little dog in French. "'Don't you know me? I know you. I am your little dog who was with you so long ago in Paris. Your dog that did tricks, the dog that they stole from you. Wake up, master, wake up. You must go back to your friends. They're near.' And all the time Gypsy kept running about and wagging his tail for pure joy that he had found the master he had thought was in Paris. "'Yes, I know you,' said his master, smiling. "'But I am so weak, I can hardly move.' "'What's the matter?' Gypsy asked. "'Are you hurt?' "'I have been wounded,' said the soldier. "'Not a large wound, but it is poisoned. "'Unless you can bring me help soon, I shall die. "'You must run and bring some of the soldiers from the camp.' "'Yes,' said Gypsy, "'I will. "'But can't you send a word by me? "'Can't you write? "'If they should hear me speak, "'I don't know what they think.' "'You're right,' said the soldier, "'to whom hope had given strength. "'And taking a pencil from his pocket, "'he wrote a little note on a scrap from an old letter "'and tied it around Gypsy's neck. "'As soon as the note was fastened, "'Gypsy dashed off at the top of his speed, "'with his heart drumming his ribs. "'He went so fast that two or three times "'he rolled head over heels, "'but stopped only long enough "'to see that the note was still fast to him, "'and then went on, helter-skelter. "'Gypsy dashed into the camp so recklessly "'that he scared the guards.' and one of them shot at him, luckily missing. But Gypsy did not stop until he tumbled into the officer's tent, where he stood wagging his tail and whining. "'My life, what's this?' exclaimed the officer, and then saw the bit of white paper. In a moment he had read the note and given his orders. In a few minutes a squad of soldiers were following at Gypsy's heels, and before nightfall the wounded man had been brought into camp, treated by the surgeon, and was resting quietly very sick and weak, but in no danger. End of chapter 13chapter 14 of Gypsy the Talking Dog, a story for young folks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy the Talking Dog a Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks Chapter 14 Much in Little During the time his old master was getting well, Gypsy was much petted by the French soldiers. They called him the Dog of the Regiment, and made him a handsome collar of the French national colours, blue, red and white, signifying hope, honour, courage. All were eager to care for the brave little comrade who had saved his master for them, Gypsy delighted in all this, but each day he would make visits to the hospital tent to learn how his master thrived. He mended rapidly, for the wound was nothing once the poison had been taken from his system. In two days he was able to see Gypsy, and the two had a long talk when no one was by. Gypsy's story you know. His master was amazed to learn of the trick by which the Gypsies had stolen his dog, still more surprised to learn of the dog's voyage to America and he was deeply touched by his dog's devotion in attempting to cross the ocean again. Both wondered at the strange chance that had brought them together in this African island so unexpectedly. Gypsy's master had also a story to tell, but it was quickly told. After losing the dog, 
which meant loss of his living, the poor fellow had tried many ways to make his daily bread. He had peddled, he had tried to enter the circus ring once more, but could find no place either as acrobat or clown. Then he tried one trade after another, but did not do very well in any. At last, he said to Gypsy, finding Paris had no use for me, and having no friend in the city, I said to myself that I would see something of the world. So I took service in the active army, and when the war began against these islanders, I was sent with my regiment to the city of Tamatave, where you landed. We had one rather serious fight, and then the natives retreated inland. There hasn't been more than a mere skirmish now and then, but one of these skirmishes nearly finished me. If you hadn't come to rescue me, I should have died, surely. When each had told his story, they began to discuss the future. Gypsy, for his master had agreed to call him by this new name, which the little dog liked best of all he had borne, had no idea except to stay with the regiment. But to his surprise, this didn't suit his old master at all. He had many talks with the dog whenever they were left a few minutes by themselves, and in all he insisted that Gypsy ought to go back to America. America, the soldier would say, is the best home for you. You found friends there, and they would be glad to keep you in comfort. If you stay with us, you will have a hard life. But I am glad to share with you, Gypsy insisted. I know, but I am likely to lose my life any day, and then what will become of you? The soldiers will be good to you, no doubt, but there is no quiet and no certainty in their life. No, Gypsy, when we get back to town, which will be in a few days now, I will find this sailor and see if I can't get him to take you back to your little American friends, Chris and Helen. Then, when I am once more free, I will come to America too, and we will live there. So their talks always ended, and at last Gypsy was brought to see that his master knew best, and consented. In a few days more the soldiers broke camp, and marched back to Tamatave, where they were in garrison. Then, as soon as he could get leave, Gypsy's old master went with him to the ship that had brought the dog from America, and inquired for Sailor Jack. The two Frenchmen were friends at once, and the sailor was delighted to see the little dog once more, and to hear of his strange adventures since their parting on the day they landed. He gladly agreed to take charge of Gypsy again, and to see him safe home to New York, as soon as the steamer sailed. She was already loading, and in a week more was ready for the return voyage. During the waiting, Gypsy had a pleasant visit with his master and the other French soldiers, but became so tired of the strict rules and hours of soldier life that he was glad to go aboard the steamer, though sorry to part with his master. They parted on the shore, Gypsy jumped into a little boat, Jack and the other sailors pulled on their oars, and it was good-bye to his old master and to Madagascar. Of course there were various interesting happenings on the voyage home, such, for instance, as the day when Gypsy discovered a fire on board the ship and gave the alarm at the top of his voice, and thus saved her. But one cannot tell everything. After a long and rather prosperous voyage, the vessel came at last to her dock in Brooklyn, and Gypsy went ashore with his sailor friend, a bigger, stronger, brighter dog than he was a few months before, and happy that his voyage, though begun so stupidly, had turned out so well. Sailor Jack was anxious to see that Gypsy was put safely on the train for the town where his friends lived, and so went with him all the way to the Grand Central Station. Once here, Gypsy bade Jack goodbye in dog fashion, and then lurked about the station, waiting to find the Brass Buttons man, who had been so good to him on his former railroad journey. Jack had attached to Gypsy's collar a tag, on which was written the name of the station to which he was going, and a request that the conductor would see he was put off there. All this was done because it was what Gypsy had asked his master to do for him. Besides, there was nothing else to do. Gypsy had told his master he would not be sent home like a package, and had insisted that a dog who could travel half around the world by himself did not need any great care. It was early in the morning when Gypsy got to the station, and it was late in the afternoon before the dog found his friend, the conductor. Seeing him, Gypsy ran up to him at once, and sitting on his haunches, waited to be noticed. "'Well, well,' said the conductor, "'it seems to me I've seen you before. How are you? What is it now, old fellow?' Gypsy shook the tag that was attached to his neck. "'Oh-ho,' said the conductor, laughing. "'I see. You have a ticket now, have you?' 
But that isn't a ticket. It's only a tag. I'm afraid somebody will have to pay your fare. Gypsy understood him and began to bark and to shake his head. This made the conductor laugh again. So you want to travel on a pass, do you? Well, you're not the only one by several, I know. Come here, pup, and I'll see if I can't fix you out. Gypsy followed, and the conductor led him through the gates and then pointed to a car. Hop in, said the conductor, and I'll let you know when to get off. Gypsy jumped into the car and gladly coiled up in a corner, feeling that his travels were almost over and were coming to a pleasant conclusion. In about twenty minutes the cars began to move and then went faster and faster until they were gliding along at express speed. Gypsy heaved a sigh of relief. Surely, said he, my master was right. I'd rather be in America, travelling on a railway, than bumping about in a packing box carried by a native porter over the hills of Madagascar. End of chapter 14「Gypsy, the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Gypsy, the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – by Tudor Jinx Chapter 15 – Gypsy Makes Another Mistake Gypsy settled down for his journey, with the feeling that now his troubles were over. He had nothing to do but wait quietly until the conductor came, to let him know that he had reached the right station, and then to hop off and make his way home along the familiar road from the station. The train stopped at many places, and Gypsy began to wonder how long it would be before the conductor came. He had waited so long about the big station in New York, that it was a late train that he was on, and now it began to be dusky. The brakeman came through the train and lighted the gas. Still Gypsy heard nothing from the conductor, and at last he became so uneasy that he got up and nosed about the door to the car to see whether anyone was coming. He felt sure the conductor had forgotten all about him and that he had been carried by his station. At last Gypsy became so certain that the journey was much longer than that he had made in traveling away from Chris and Helen's house to New York, that he made up his mind to find the conductor at any risk. So he left the part of the car in which he had been put, and went out among the passengers. He went so quietly that no one noticed him, and by waiting near the door until it was opened at a station, he soon succeeded in getting into the next car. Here he met a man in a blue uniform with brass buttons, and ran eagerly to him. But Gypsy had made a mistake. This conductor was a stranger, and on seeing the dog, he asked, How did this dog get in here? There was no answer, and the man asked again, Who owns this dog? There was no reply. And so the conductor, picking Gypsy up by the neck, carried him to the platform and threw him off, luckily at a time when the train was not going very fast. Gypsy had no time to make any protest. In fact, before he could imagine what the conductor was going to do, Gypsy found himself flying through the air and hoping that he might be lucky enough to alight on something soft. He did. He fell on something that was altogether too soft, for he went plump into a stream of water that flowed beside the railway. This gave him a good ducking, but probably saved him from injury. Gypsy could swim, of course, and when he came up from his dive, he was thoroughly cross and disgusted. There, he sputtered, that's just the way things go. I can sail all around the world without getting my feet wet, and when I am almost home, I must be thrown head over heels into a ditch beside the road. He climbed the bank and sat down to get his bearings. He remained where he was for some time hoping that he might see something that would give him a hint of his whereabouts. But he could see nothing but a long, bare stretch of railroad track, shut in on each side by woods. He could not see even this very distinctly, as it was now nightfall, and there was no moon or other light, except the faint glimmer of a railroad switch light 
far down the track. Gypsy concluded that he must, of course, have been carried beyond his station, and so ought to follow the railroad in that direction. He was well rested now. He had not been hurt by his souse in the ditch, and he was chilly when he sat still. So up he got, and away he went along, over the ties, but keeping a sharp eye forward, so that he might have early warning of the coming of another train. He traveled several miles in this way, now and then getting off the track, when warned by the gleam of the locomotive headlight. And then he came to a place where the road branched. Now Gypsy had not the faintest idea which road to take, and he came to a halt, completely discouraged. He was in a new part of the country. His scent was useless. He could see no house or any sign of life or of human beings, except the railroad signals. While he was hesitating what to do, another train came pounding along, and Gypsy ran up a little bank by the roadside, from which to watch it flash by him. He was almost blinded by the headlight and lighted windows of the cars, and had to blink his eyes before he could see clearly again. He turned his back on the railroad to rest his eyesight by looking into the dark woods, and then he saw a light in the distance. For fear lest he might take the wrong branch, Gypsy did not dare follow the railroad further just then, and so he thought he would go toward this light. He entered the woods and made his way slowly through the underbrush, now seeing the light in the distance, and then losing it again when he crossed some hollow. But he was certainly coming nearer to it all the time, and so he kept on. When he had approached near enough to make out what the light was, he could see that it was a bonfire in the woods. It had burned quite low, and only now and then flared up, so as to show anything of what surrounded it. Gypsy made up his mind to go a little nearer, and see whether there were any men about, but he meant to be very cautious. Unfortunately, Gypsy went too near. Suddenly, a big dog rose and came dashing toward him, barking loud and acting as if he would eat Gypsy at once. Gypsy could not run away, for that would have caused the big dog to attack him, and so he bristled up the hair on his neck, showed his teeth, and growled out in dog language, Look out! If you come too near, I shall bite. But several men who had been sleeping near the fire had come after the big dog. They carried sticks and were ready to fight. Gypsy's heart beat fast, but he could not run away for the fierce dog was only waiting a chance to seize him. As the men came up, one of them said, Oh, it's only a little dog. But wait, I think... Yes, I'm sure now. It's Juckle. Then Gypsy knew that he had fallen upon the Gypsy's camp, and he made one wild attempt to dash into the woods. But no sooner had he started than the big dog jumped for him and caught him by the ear. That's right, cried the young man. It was certainly Gypsy Joe. Hold him, Blackie. Hold him. I'm coming. Joe rushed forward and seized Gypsy by the collar, and Gypsy's chance of escaping was gone. They took their captive back to the camp and chained him to one of the wagon wheels. And to make it still surer that he should not get away, they set the big dog, Blackie, to watch over Gypsy a thing the ugly brute was only too glad to do. So just when Gypsy had felt that all his troubles and trials were at an end, he had fallen again into the hands of his worst enemies. The poor little fellow did not sleep a wink that night, and in the morning he was tossed into one of the wagons and chained to its side. Then the Gypsies broke up their camp and made their way out of the woods. Every now and then the man Joe would come to the side of the wagon to see that the captive was still secure, and at these visits he would tell Gypsy what was in store for him. Aha, said Joe. So you couldn't keep away from us. You were too fond of us, weren't you, Juckle? Well, we'll see you don't run away again in a hurry. And by the way, I owe you a thrashing for the way you jumped at my heels when I had to leave you with your fine friends. I'll keep the dust out of your hide, Juckle. 
Gypsy paid no attention to Joe, for really he was too miserable. He remained crouched in a corner of the wagon, and would not even look at his tormentor, who came again and again to gloat over him. They traveled all the morning, and at noon they encamped in the woods again to eat dinner. They gave Gypsy some pieces of hard bread and a little water, and then sat down outside while they ate. But during this halt, Gypsy overheard the two Gypsies who had stolen him, talking together, and learned something that pleased him. You're a fool, said the older man to the younger one, to keep in this part of the country. If you stay here, and the dog should get away, he'll find his way to his old friends again. He won't get away, said Joe. I'll take good care of that, and I must stay here for a day or two, for there's money to be made at the fair. Is there a fair? Alexander asked. Yes, Joe answered. It's the county fair, and I have to buy a horse. Besides, by making Juckle do his tricks, I can earn a hatful of money. You won't dare bring him out. But I shall, said Joe. He's a smart little scamp, I know. But no one comes to these fairs except the farmer folk. There'll be none of his old friends there. I wouldn't take the risk, said Alexander. But I'm going to take it, Joe answered. So from this talk, Gypsy knew that his friends were not far away, and he hoped something might happen to save him from the hands of the thieves who had stolen him, and who now meant to put him again to the hard life from which he thought he had escaped forever. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry – Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – by Tudor Jenks Chapter Sixteen – A Talk at Midnight On the day of the county fair, the gypsy camp was early astir meaning to get to the grounds as soon as possible, in order that they might choose a good place for their encampment. The chief of the gypsies, old Alexander, had spoken to the managers of the fair, and had told them what an attractive addition to the show a real gypsy encampment would be. The managers had agreed with him, and so in all the show bills posted about the country the coming of the gypsy riders, gypsy fortune-tellers, and gypsy dancers had been well advertised. If Joe had known that he was to be so lucky as to capture his best performing dog again, no doubt he too would have been told about in big letters on the barns and in the post offices for several miles around. Joe was glad now that this had not been done, for in spite of his brag to Alexander, he was uneasy for fear Gypsy might be seen by someone who knew him. Still, he had to take chances if he wished to make any money out of the dog. Arriving at the fair, the men put up tents made of white sheeting. The women put on glass beads, coloured ribbons, big earrings, and a dozen other things they never wore at any other time. All tried to look as much as they could in the way they thought the farmers would expect real gypsies to look, for they hoped to attract silly young men and maidens who wished their fortunes told, and also to do a little horse trading, and possibly a little pocket picking if any came in their way. Poor Gypsy would have been entirely miserable, but for a hope that the fair might be the means of letting his friends know of his captivity. This hope made him so ready to do his part in preparation for his tricks, that Joe was quite delighted with him, and even gave him several lumps of sugar for doing so well what he was told. Gypsy had another reason for wishing to please Joe. He was afraid that at the last moment Joe might decide it was dangerous to have the dog perform. So Gypsy held his little gun, tumbled, rolled, stood on his head, and in short carried out all Joe's orders so promptly and so well that Joe actually patted him on the head and said, Bravo, Juckle, there never was so bright a trick dog as you. I'm glad to see you're not sulky. Keep up your good behaviour and you and I will get on famously. Let bygones be bygones and we'll be friends yet. But Gypsy was honest, and he couldn't wag his tail just then, even though he knew it was the wise thing to do. The morning of the first fair day passed very pleasantly for all in the camp. 
It was sunny and bright. The place was filled with visitors. They were generous with their money, and every one of the gypsies was good-humoured. Early in the afternoon, Joe wrote out a big sign, in which he gave a glowing description of the performing dog, the most intelligent and amusing quadruped in the whole world, an animal that could do anything but talk, and so on, until he had filled a large sheet of paper. This was fastened up outside of their largest tent, and inside they put all the chairs they could get. People came in crowds to the show, and filled the tent, paying twenty-five cents each. Then poor Gypsy was brought out, unchained, and made to perform. For the reasons already given, he did his very best, but all the time Gypsy kept looking at everyone who entered the tent, hoping to see someone he knew. There were three performances given that afternoon, and at all of them Gypsy failed to see a familiar face. But just as he was being led from the tent back to the wagon to be chained up for the night, Gypsy's heart suddenly gave a bound. He caught sight of a little black pony with a white mane and tail. It was Galopoff. But to his dismay, the pony did not seem to know him, and would not even look his way. Poor Gypsy tugged at his chain for a moment, fearing that Galopoff had not seen him. But he need not have worried about that. There was very little that Galopoff did not notice. And in fact, though Gypsy did not know it, it was Galopoff who had brought about their meeting. Galopoff loved racing, and had won many prizes when he was younger. He always begged to be taken to the races whenever any were held. This had brought him to the fair, and once there he had seen the placard upon the tent of the gypsy encampment. Galopoff had then begged his master to let him stay a while near the tent, so that he might find out whether the dog advertised to perform was his old friend Gypsy, though that seemed hardly possible. So now, just as Gypsy was being led by him, the clever little pony pretended to snap crossly at the dog, bringing his sharp teeth almost to the dog's ear. Joe thought the pony was ugly-tempered and hastily snatched Gypsy out of the pony's reach. Really, while his mouth was almost at Gypsy's ear, Galopoff seized the opportunity to whisper to him just the words, Tonight! Now Gypsy had some sense, and he understood at once that he was to keep on the watch so that he could be ready to help in any plan the pony might be able to think of. So, when all the rest of the camp were fast asleep late that night, Gypsy kept his bright eyes open and his ears alert for any sign that might show his friends were near. About midnight he heard a soft brushing against the wagon curtains, and very slowly and cautiously, so as not to rattle his chain, Gypsy drew himself close to where he had heard the sound. Then he heard a soft whisper, it was Galopoff's voice, but so low that it could not have been heard even a few feet off. "'Are you awake, Gypsy?' the pony asked. "'Yes. Can't you get me away?' "'Not tonight, I think,' said Galopoff. "'It is much easier to get into Vixie's than out of them. "'But tomorrow night I think we can do something for you, for I shall give my mind to it.' "'But why don't you come to the camp right in daylight "'and demand that they let me go?' "'asked Gypsy, still in the same soft whisper. "'Because we couldn't show we owned you,' said Galopoff. "'Don't you see, the Gypsies have as much right to you as anyone else. "'You chose to go away from Chris and Helen. "'They let you go, and so now they don't own you. "'Your own master is far away, I suppose.' "'Yes, he's in Madagascar. I saw him there.' It's a big island off the coast of Africa. See here, Gypsy, Galopoff whispered. This is no class in geography. Besides, I know where Madagascar is. Listen to me. You have no owner, and these gypsies, goodness, I wish your name wasn't the same. It is confusing. These thieves have as much right to you as we can show. But, said poor Gypsy, much discouraged by this speech, surely you're not going to leave me in their hands. "'Of course not,' said Galopoff. "'I was talking of what the law might say if we claimed you. "'We're not going to claim anything. "'We're going to take you and let them claim you, if they dare. "'You'll save time if you'll do the listening and let me talk.' "'All right, go on, Galopoff,' said Gypsy more cheerfully. "'Very well. "'Now tomorrow night I shall bring a few friends with me, "'and we'll see whether we can't outwit these dog-stealers.' Honest folks are nearly always cleverer than rogues when they give their minds to it, I believe. So you be ready, and at about this same hour you'll see something happening. Goodbye, or 
since you're a French dog, I'll say au revoir. Almost without a sound, Galopoff was gone. He had not waked even Blackie, the big watchdog, and little Gypsy, full of hope, fell fast asleep and slept quietly until sunrise. End of chapter 16《ジプシー・ o f Gypsy the Talking Dog》A Story for Young Folks。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry。Gypsy the Talking Dog A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks。Chapter 17 A Council of War。If there was anything Galopoff really enjoyed, it was a chance to distinguish himself. He was so delighted with his good luck in finding Gypsy, and his head was so full of plans and schemes for rescuing the captive, that he was really frisky when he was taken out next day. His master, who was driving him, had not seen him so full of spirits in a long time, and did not know what to make of it, for Galopoff was not so young as he had been. At last, when they came to a part of the road where there was no danger of being overheard, he said aloud, addressing himself to the pony, "'What is the matter with you, Galopoff? Have you been taking too many oats?' Galopoff tossed his head indignantly. "'No,' he answered. "'This is not the effect of anything so common as oats. I have just made a discovery.' "'What is it?' asked his master. "'Something fine at the fair?' "'Absurd,' Galopoff replied. "'Do you remember the great Russian fairs?' And can you ask me whether I have been pleased over anything at this trumpery little county fair? No, I have found out a piece of villainy. Ah, said his master, more seriously. Something really important, then? Yes, something in which I am going to ask your help. Do you remember the clever little dog that ran away from the gypsies and was taken care of by your little friends Christopher and Helen? I remember him, said his master but I thought he went abroad to look for an old friend. So he did, Galopoff went on, but now he's back again, after a journey half around the world, and somehow he has fallen into the hands of the gypsies who stole him before. Perhaps he went back to them of his own accord, said Galopoff's master. Was he the performing dog they advertised at the fair? Yes, and afterwards last night I went to the gypsy encampment in the woods nearby, "'Wasn't that a little risky?' his master interrupted. "'They might have stolen you, you know.' Galopoff was much diverted by this idea. "'They steal me?' he exclaimed. "'Why, the very idea is amusing. "'I almost wish they had tried it. "'It's a long time since I've had a real good chance "'to kick anything that deserved it. "'But I must not waste time talking about such foolishness. "'What I wish to do is to put you into full possession "'of the facts in the case.' and then secure your aid or your advice, as the case may demand. "'But what do you intend to do?' asked his master. "'I haven't entirely made up my mind,' Galopoff replied, "'and so I am going to think the matter over quietly, when I am taking my noonday lunch, and then I shall ask you to have a talk with me about it.' "'Very well,' answered the Russian prince, who was almost as fond of adventure as even Galopoff himself. "'I'll come out to the stable this afternoon about three o'clock,' and we'll hold a council of war. This being settled, they drove home, and each went to the noontime meal. About three o'clock the Russian prince came out to Galopoff's stable, and sent Terence, the stable boy, on an errand that would keep him out of the way. Then he drew up a chair, Galopoff came out of his stall, and they settled down for a good talk. I don't remember just how much I've told you about Gypsy, Galopoff began. Gypsy, you know, is the name of the dog we spoke about this morning but perhaps it will be enough to give you just a brief resume or synopsis of the situation. Galopoff knew a good many big words, and liked to use them when sure they would be understood. "'I know only that he has been stolen twice by these gypsies,' said his master. "'Who owns the dog?' "'I should think that a lawyer would say he still belonged to his French master,' Galopoff said. "'And since he is out of our reach, I don't think it altogether wise to raise that question.' My idea is to get him away from the thieves, and let them claim him if they dare. Good so far, his master agreed. The next question is how to get hold of him. 
They are very cautious now, and they keep Gypsy chained in one of their wagons. Near the wagon the Gypsy men sleep, and besides, there's a big watchdog on guard. I wish he was in some place far away from here. It is easy enough to outwit men. Thank you, said his master, smiling. When they're asleep, Galopoff went on coolly. But with a faithful watchdog, it is a different matter. Still, I think it can be done. Do you mean to steal Gypsy from their camp? Exactly. And I have thought out a plan. I admit that, though I am not often puzzled, the big watchdog was a sticker, if one may be allowed a piece of slang. Oh, certainly, said his master, smiling to himself. Thank you, Galopoff replied politely. At first I thought I would just steal quietly into the camp and knock his head off with a good kick. Then that seemed too rough, perhaps. It does sound a little rough, said the prince. And then I had one of my clever ideas, Galopoff went on. Do you know the dog Bruno that lives about a mile or two down the road? I remember. A nuisance of a dog that came out and barked at you one day. Yes, said Galopoff. I gave him a gentle hoof touch to teach him better manners. It did. He's been very sensible ever since. Sent his regards to me once or twice. Bows and smiles and wags at me now when I pass. Yes, that's the dog. My idea is to take him with us. That is, with you and me. So I am to go? His master asked roguishly. I am sure you couldn't stay away, Galopoff answered. You and I have been through many a fine row together. Do you remember on our trip home from the Siberian mines? But there, that story will keep till I publish my life. Yes, we will call upon Bruno to help. Bruno is to take up the attention of the gypsy's big dog. I will take up the attention of the men, and you will slip quietly to the wagon and set the little captive free. That's all that is needed. Just set him free. He'll do the rest. He's a good runner. But how do you mean to take up the men's attention? I'll attend to that, Galopoff said, laughing. But I shall have to ask my mistress to make me a few things I need. Do you think she'll mind? Certainly not. Will you come up to the piazza? She's sitting there with her sewing. Galopoff agreed and went with his master to where Lola, now grown up and married, was sitting beside her mending basket. Whatever it was Galopoff said, it amused her very much, and she laughingly agreed to make the few things he required. But she had to put her other work aside, for the expedition was to start that very night. Meanwhile, Galopoff trotted out of the yard in order to ask Bruno to take part in the plan. He found the big dog, nearly as big as the pony himself, roaming about the front yard of his own house, and in a few words explained what was wanted. Will I do it? Bruno exclaimed. Sure I will then, for it was a decent little dog he was. I met him one day, just as he was going by, and passed the time of day with him. Besides, I had one little argument like with a gypsy's big brute of a dog, and was left unfinished. I owe him a nip or two, and we'll see which of us has the worst of the discussion. Bruno agreed to call at Galopoff's stable at ten o'clock that night, ready to take part in the affair, and with his fighting collar on. When Galopoff reached home, he found the things Lola had made for him were ready to be tried on, and a jolly time they had making all snug and tidy. By dinner time, about half past six, all was ready, and Galopoff returned to the stable in order that he might rest and be fresh for his part in the night's work. Galopoff had not the slightest doubt his plan would succeed, and because he believed so in himself, the pony usually did succeed in everything he undertook. Meanwhile, Gypsy was spending a second day at the fair, going through his tricks to amuse the country folk. End of chapter 17「ありがとうございました。That while he was very happy, he had found things a little dull. Now that he was going to pass an exciting night, to have a fight perhaps, and maybe take some sound whacks from the gypsy's sticks, he felt several years younger already. His eyes were bright, and he swished his tail and tossed his mane, 
as he practised kicking a sort of stuffed bag that had been made for the purpose. Galopoff had some time before told his master that he wanted a kicking bag. A kicking bag? What's that? the prince asked. Why, it's like a man's punching bag, something to practise on. Sometimes I just must kick. Now Terence is a good boy, though he has some of Patrick's faults, and I don't really want to kick Terence. And yet several times I have felt tempted to send Terence flying through the stable door, merely for exercise. So I think I would like a kicking bag. The prince knew that Terence was in no danger, but he had a large leather bag made and hung nicely in reach of Galopoff's sharp little heels. It didn't last very long, for Galopoff kicked it to pieces in about six weeks. He told his master that it was a great relief to his mind. Now, in thinking of their expedition, Galopoff aimed kick after kick at the kicking bag, and made it go whack against the stable ceiling, again and again, so that Terence knew that Galopoff was very happy. It was a sure sign. When Galopoff had kicked himself somewhat out of breath, he rested a little and began to think. Then he had another of his good ideas. He remembered what a jolly little fellow Chris was, and how brave he had been when Gypsy Joe came to reclaim the dog, and Galopoff decided that he would ask Chris to be one of the rescuing party. Galopoff was never locked up. Both the bar of his stall and the door of his stable were arranged so that he could open them from the outside or inside, by ways known only to himself, his master, and mistress. Turning about, he raised the bar of his stall, opened the stable door, and was out in a moment. The sun was just setting, and Galopoff galloped away along the road, towards Christopher's home, where he arrived just after dark. Galopoff couldn't whistle, and at first he couldn't think how to bring Christopher out. He had never talked with any member of that family, though he knew Gypsy had told them he could talk. Remembering this, Galopoff went up near to the lighted windows, and gave a low whinny, and then called, Chris! Oh, Chris! There was no answer. Galopoff went closer to the window, and tried again. This time, Chris came to the inside of the window, raised the shade, and looked out. He could not at first see much, looking from the lighted room into the darkness. But as his eyes became used to the change, he saw Galopoff standing near the house and knew him at once by his white mane and white tail. Opening the window, he said, What is it, Galopoff? Anything wrong at your house? Not at all, said the pony. We're always all right. But I have found your dog, Gypsy. Found Gypsy? exclaimed Chris. Why, I thought he was in Europe. He came back. I haven't had much time to talk with him yet, but he's in trouble. Somehow he has fallen into the hands of the Gypsies again and they're showing his tricks at the county fair. But we must rescue him, said Chris. We will, said Galopoff. That is why I'm here. I came after you. Go and ask your father whether you can come over to my home, and may go with my master to get the dog away from the gypsies. Go at once, for I wish to take you back with me. Hurry, Chris. Chris closed the window and pulled down the shade. While Chris was consulting his father, Galopoff went round to the front door and waited impatiently for the boy to appear. When the door opened, Chris and Helen both stood there, and as usual, both began to talk at once. Galopoff didn't understand a word. Ahem, <coughs> said he. It's a charming duet, but I can't tell what it's all about. Chris, since you are going with me, suppose you let Helen have a few words. Thank you, Galopoff, said Helen. I just wanted to tell you that father says Chris can go, and that I've brought my gold piece, so that you may have some money if you need it. Here's mine too, Chris added, drawing it from his pocket. Very well, Galopoff answered. Put them in your pocket again, hop on my back, and away we go. Chris caught hold of the mane, leaped on Galopoff's back. Helen waved her hand and wished them good luck. Galopoff gave a quick bound that almost unseated Chris, wheeled about, and trotted down the road. When Galopoff reached his home again, he told Chris to go up to the house, and explain to the prince that he was a new recruit for the expedition. And meanwhile Galopoff advised him to take a little nap, until it was time to start. Chris found this advice good, and followed it, after a little talk with his friend the prince. At ten o'clock Bruno came trotting into the yard, and was warmly greeted by Galopoff 
who praised him for being punctual. In a few minutes more, the prince and Chris came from the house, and the expedition was ready to start. Galopoff invited Chris to ride, and the prince and Bruno went alongside. It was quite a long walk, but the prince was too heavy for Galopoff to carry, and they did not care to take any other of the horses with them. After Chris was mounted, a large bundle was strapped to the saddle behind him, and then the four members of the rescue expedition took the road for the gypsy encampment. It was a cloudy night, with occasional glimpses of the moon. As they were still a long way from the encampment, they did not mind making a little noise and talking a little. Bruno, who had a great respect for the pony, kept close to his head, and the prince talked with Chris, explaining what Galopoff's plan was. Now that Chris had joined them, there was a change made. It was decided that Chris should be the one to release Gypsy from his chain, and that the prince should do his part in the conflict with the men. On the way, the prince stepped to the side of the road, and cut himself a stout cudgel. He did not mean to use it unless he was forced to defend himself. Chris had no weapon, since he was to take no part in the battle. Bruno needed no other weapon than his teeth, and Galopoff always had his four hoofs with him. And then, besides, there was that mysterious bundle strapped to the back of his saddle. Now they were coming near to the gypsy settlement, and it was time the bundle was opened. They drew aside into a piece of woods, and the prince took the bundle, opened it, and drew from it some clothing. Then, to Chrissy's amusement, the prince shook these things out, and Galopoff, with his master's help, proceeded to put them on. The costume, which had been made by Lola to fit Galopoff, was of coarse sheeting, and was like a giant's pyjamas, being a loose jacket and trousers, but with tapes instead of buttons to fasten it. Besides the clothing there was a tall, white, pointed cap, from which hung a loose veil to cover Galopoff's head, and having places cut for his eyes. When this was all put on, and Galopoff stood up on his hind legs, he made a curious figure, a figure very amusing to his friends, who had seen him put it on, but one that would be really terrifying to any who did not know what it was. "'What do you think of my dress, Chris?' Galopoff asked, when Bruno was out of the way. "'It's the funniest thing I ever saw,' said Chris, laughing. "'It may be funny to you,' Galopoff answered, "'but you will find that it will scare those dog thieves out of their seven senses and a year's growth. "'And by the way, be sure to warn Gypsy about it, or he may be scared too, "'for I shall make some blood-curdling shrieks if my voice holds out.' "'At this moment Bruno came near again, and so Galopoff had to stop talking. "'He could not have said much more anyway.' for now they saw the gleam of the gypsy's bonfire through the woods, and all were silent, creeping nearer and nearer to the sleeping camp. Even Gypsy himself, who was wide awake and anxiously looking for the arrival of his rescuers, had nothing to warn him of their approach until Galopoff gave a wild cry at the top of his lungs, which he did to make everybody in the camp look that way, while Chris slipped around at the other side and came close to Gypsy's wagon prison. Again Galopoff called aloud, and then was silent. Everybody in the gypsies' camp awoke, and all gazed into the darkness that surrounded them, wondering what could have made so queer a noise. Meanwhile Chris, unnoticed, was making his way to the wagon where Gypsy was chained. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Gypsy the Talking Dog, A Story for Young Folks, by Tudor Jenks. Chapter 19. The Battle in the Woods. After the attacking party had returned to their homes, Chris, of course, went straight to bed. And it was high time for it was half-past midnight. But in the morning, which luckily was Saturday, and I don't know what they would have done if it had been a school day, for Helen positively couldn't have waited another minute to hear about it. In the morning at breakfast, Helen began on Chris before she began on her toast, and she always took toast before she took anything else. "'Oh, Chris,' she said, "'did you get him?' "'Did we get him?' he repeated in a scornful, big-brotherish sort of tone. Do you see me alive, sister dear? 
or did I leave my mortal frame on the field of carnage? Did we get him, indeed? Now, Chris, said Helen, it isn't declamation day. You stop your boy on the burning deck talk, and let me know all about it. Please do, Chris. Listen, me sister, and you shall hear of the midnight fight of your brother, dear, Chris began whereupon Helen pretended she was about to throw a biscuit at him, and he stopped. Honest and true, Helen, it was great, and I am just dying to tell you all about it. But I am going to leave out all the first part and get right to the real exciting part. You know how Galopoff came for me, and how I rode away on his back? Well, when we got there, I took a little snooze to prepare me for the fray, and about ten or half past, we set out, Galopoff and his master, Bruno and myself, I rode on Galopoff at his invitation, and it was bully. The others walked. When we were almost there, they all stopped, and Galopoff put on the funniest rig you ever saw, a suit of horse pyjamas. And then when he reared up and walked on his hind legs, he looked like, well, all possessed. It would make a cow laugh to see him. It made me. What was that for? Helen asked. You'll see, Chris answered. He liked to tell stories in his own way. Then the Russian prince cut a big stick with a knob on the end, and we went on, going through the woods like a lot of fellows going to hook apples. I went first, because I had to shear around to one side, so as to take the enemy in the rear. You see, Helen, the pony had told us Gypsy was chained up in one of the wagons, and it was my proud privilege to set him free. How were you going to cut the chain? asked Helen. That shows, said Chris, that you have a big head. Do you know, none of us thought about that. I suppose we thought that he would be fastened only by a snap hook. And was he? answered Helen, delighted to be praised. If the audience, Chris remarked, will keep their seats and refrain from interrupting the lecturer, they will be informed of all points of importance in due course of time. Chris, do go on, cried Helen. As you will, me gracious Quivine. I sheared off, as I have told you, and went on a circumbendibus route. Meanwhile, the cavalry, Galopoff, the artillery, and the rest of the forces advanced in good order. I got to the wagon all right, all right, and there was Gypsy wagging his stumpum tailum, fit to shake himself, and dancing about like a new girl at dancing school. His chain rattled, and I was afraid they would hear him. Meanwhile, I had raised the signal for the attack by hooting like an owl, and then, and thereupon, Galopoff raised that voice of his, and emitted a howl that he must have invented for the occasion. It made my flesh creep, and I was ready for it too. It woke the echoes, the gypsies, the watchdog, and everything else. Then the fun began. The gypsies jumped out. They have the untidy but convenient habit of sleeping in their clothes, and so they were all ready. Every one of them seemed to have a stick too. They sprang to their feet and tried to find out what had happened. The only one that seemed to keep his senses was their big black dog. He showed fight, but as he came forward, Bruno fell on him like a cartload of bricks, and at it they went. It would have been worth seeing, except there wasn't time to look at it, for just then Galopoff appeared walking on his hind legs, with his big foolscap hat on, looking like nothing anybody ever saw. Gypsy was scared, but I said, Hush, it's only Galopoff in white clothes, and he kept quiet. "'Goodness!' Helen exclaimed. "'Did it frighten the gypsies?' "'I should remark,' said Chris. "'They just howled. "'But the oldest one was game. "'He drew a pistol, and though his hand shook, "'he tried to fire it. "'But just then the Russian came on a run "'and sent the pistol flying with his cudgel. "'The other gypsies had taken to their heels, "'and we could hear them crashing through the woods "'and bumping their heads into branches "'and other hard objects. "'And what were you doing?' Helen asked. I admit that for a little while I was watching the rumpus, Chris replied, and then, suddenly remembering that Galopoff, our general, expected every man to do his duty, I turned my attention to the chain question. I tried to find the hook, but there was no hook. I found the chain fastened with a little padlock. I was scared then, for I didn't see exactly how I was going to carry off dog and wagon and all. At length, Gypsy, seeing my trouble, asked me coolly, Have you a knife? And I replied, yes, but you can't cut steel with a knife. Then he said, but you can cut leather with a knife. Why don't you cut my collar? And then my great intellect saw the point, 
and taking out my trusty jackknife, I slit the leather, and the dog was free. He jumped out of the wagon, and we joined our victorious forces, or all but one. <gasps> I hope no one was hurt, Helen asked anxiously. No, the missing battalion was that of General Bruno. He had put the big watchdog to an ignominious flight, and was chasing him into the next county. The rest of us were all present or accounted for and Gypsy was jumping about as all, and wriggling and whining, the happiest thing you ever see. Chris, Helen objected, that isn't grammar. It is poetry, said Chris, like Shakespeare. He and I have a grammar of our own. Where was I? Oh, yes. Well, Galopoff was trying to get rid of his costume, and Gypsy almost smothered himself in the folds of it, trying to help. After a while, the pony jumped out of the ruins of his pyjamas, I got on his back with Gypsy in my arms, and a retreat was ordered, without awaiting the return of General Bruno. I don't know whether he is back yet, and I'm sure those Gypsies will not be back for a week. But Chris, Helen objected, after she had clapped her hands with delight over the glorious news, what is to prevent those men from hanging around here and stealing Gypsy some other time? That shows the wisdom of our commander, the celebrated General Galopoff. If he hadn't scared the thieves, they would never have rested until they had the dog again. But now they don't know what it was that sent them flying, and probably they will be only too glad to get away with their lives. And where is Gypsy? Helen asked. He went home with Galopoff, and the pony said that he would bring him over this morning. Let's finish our breakfast and go out, so that we can see him coming. A few more buckwheat cakes and they were done, and betook themselves to the lawn, where there was a sort of rustic house. Here they sat and waited, with their eyes on the road that led from their house to that of the Russian prince. "'Sister Helen, Sister Helen, can you see anything coming?' Christopher asked several times, and at last Helen jumped up and cried, "'Yes, I do, and I think, I, I'm sure, it is Galopoff, with Gypsy riding on his back.' Both the children went tumbling out. Galopoff broke into a gallop, and came sweeping over the lawn with a rush. And Gypsy gave a flying leap from the pony's back, and landed in Christopher's arms. Then there was a joyful time. When they were quiet again, Galopoff spoke. Do you know, Gypsy, he asked, that your last leap was a very clever performance? It seems to me you show real talent. You would do very well as a circus dog. But I don't care to be a circus dog, said Gypsy. I want to keep quiet at home. I'm glad I went to find my master, but I am ever so glad to be at home again. Oh, by the way, said Chris, have you heard anything of Bruno? Met him on our way, Galopoff replied. He told us that except the one with the clipped French poodle, it was the best fight he had ever had. End of chapter 19「A Story for Young Folks」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry Gypsy the Talking Dog – A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks Chapter 20 – In Safe Harbour It was lucky that it was Saturday. No sooner had Galopoff gone home then Chris and Helen made Gypsy comfortable on one of the benches, and he settled down with a long sigh of comfort. Now, said Gypsy, if my old master were only here, I wouldn't have a thing to ask for in the world. But why can't you just stay with us? asked Helen. I can, and I will, if you'll have me, Gypsy answered. My master told me to wait for him, and he would come to America, and I believe he will. Where did you leave him? Helen asked. Now, Helen, said Chris, you always want to spoil a story by hearing the end of it first. You must wait until Gypsy is all rested out, and then let him tell us all about it, from the very beginning down to the time when I found him in the wagon, and didn't know enough to cut his leather collar and set him free. I'm not tired, said Gypsy, and if you have time, I can begin my story now. Don't you have to go to school, though? No, thank goodness said Helen. It's Saturday. But, said Chris, I think you have done enough, Gypsy. We can wait till another time for your story. Now let us plan about your staying here. 
First, I want you to have a nice, comfortable doghouse to live in, for I'm sure you would rather sleep outside, wouldn't you? Yes, Gypsy answered. I am no lap dog. I have been long enough at sea to like fresh air, and what is more, I want to do something for my living. It's all very well for a canary or a parrot to spend his time eating, sleeping, and fooling about, but for a dog or a horse there is plenty of work in the world, and they are no use except when they do their work. Isn't Galopoff a splendid little fellow? Helen exclaimed. Yes, indeed, said Gypsy. I owe him more than I can ever pay. He doesn't want any pay, said Chris. It's nothing but fun for him. He loves to go into all sorts of adventures. Well, I'm going over to see him now and then, said Gypsy, for there is lots to learn from a pony like that. Still, I can see where he got it. I have been knocking about the world myself for these last few months, and I've picked up a great deal of useful knowledge. But to tell you the truth, children, I'm so far from being tired that I think a good scamper would do me good. Come on! So saying, Gypsy jumped down from the bench and ran off at full speed leaving Chris and Helen in a regular romp that only ended when all three were out of breath. And that was the first of many jolly times they had together. Sometimes, too, Galopoff was one of the party, and when he was, it was amusing to see him put on all the airs of a very dignified creature. He would watch indulgently their wild games of tag or hide-and-seek or magic music, until he became so interested that he forgot to be sedate and reserved. Then he would join in with all the spirit of his younger days, and the whole quartet would romp and play like school let out. Then, too, Gypsy and Galopoff would become interested in practicing tricks and performances, and no circus ever showed livelier and more exciting feats than were performed by the dog and his friend the pony. Galopoff was always talkative, but Gypsy never had much to say, and it was only after many days that the children learned of all his adventures of his two sea voyages, his two railroad journeys, his stay in Madagascar, his two times of captivity in the gypsies' camp, and his early life in Paris. And by the way, the gypsies seemed to have left the country, for neither Alexander nor Joe nor their dog Blackie, nor any of the tribe, were seen about that part of the country again. Nobody knew where they were, and really nobody cared. So the year rolled away through the spring and the fall, and to another winter. And queerly enough, as the month of November came to a close, December began. But even then, time still kept rolling on, and days were counted into weeks, until that remarkable annual occurrence known as Christmas was about ready to happen. And one day the sun rose as usual, and behold, all the calendars agreed that it was the 25th of December. And Chris and Helen arose at the same awful hour of earliness, descended upon their stuffed stockings like a couple of crows and two cornstalks, and industriously dug their way down to the toes of their stockings, and there found two more gold pieces, and then remembered that they had never spent the first two that had come a whole year before. But strange as that was, something still more remarkable happened before the day was done. They had a Christmas tree, but that wasn't it, and when the doors were opened to show the tree, there stood a real Santa Claus. But that wasn't the remarkable thing either. And when the Santa Claus came forward with his red robe and his long white beard, Gypsy, who had been looking on in a quiet and dignified manner, though enjoying everything, including a handsome new silver collar, suddenly seemed to lose his wits. He jumped forward and whined and wagged his tail and barked himself hoarse as he leaped up on Santa Claus, who seemed quite as much excited as Gypsy himself. Chris and Helen didn't understand this at all. They had supposed that their father had dressed himself up to be Santa Claus, and they had never seen Gypsy show so much affection for him before. But now their father came in, and Santa Claus took off his mask and beard, and they saw a pleasant, jolly, smiling face, but one they had never seen before. "'Who is it, father?' asked Christopher. "'Who is it?' "'I know, I know,' cried Helen. I believe it is Gypsy's master come to America. And that was it. Helen was right. And then neither wondered at Gypsy's delight over this unexpected Christmas present. They found out afterwards that the Russian prince, Galopoff's master, having friends in Paris, and the French being on the best of terms with the Russians, 
was able to secure a discharge from service for the French soldier, and had also seen that there was money enough sent him to enable him to pay his way to America. He had arrived only a day before Christmas, and then the little surprise had been arranged. I suspect Galopoff had a hoof in it. So now all were together again. Chris and Helen's father was very glad to give the Frenchman a place as gardener and handyman, until he could find some pleasanter or more profitable work, and Gypsy went to stay in a sort of little porter's lodge, where he and his master were made at home. Only one dissatisfied creature remained, and that was Galopoff. He professed to think it very stupid for the dog's adventures to end so happily. He told Chris and Helen that the only way to enjoy life was to keep moving and to get all the adventures one could. But this did not bother the children at all, for they saw that Galopoff himself was quite willing to remain quietly at home, instead of running about seeking strange experiences. One day, when the children and Galopoff were near the rustic summer-house, Chris said to the pony, as he pointed to Gypsy's master at work on the greenhouses, with the little dog sitting contentedly at his master's heels, Galopoff! Do you think those two ought to go out in the world again, just so they might have exciting times? Come, tell the truth now, and without making believe. Christopher, said Galopoff, it is a long time since I have talked any poetry, but now I'm going to repeat a few lines that I made up myself, and they will answer your question for you. Here they are. The quiet nag that stays at home will never know both Greece and Rome, but nags that stay at home in peace will never miss either Rome or Greece. So choose whichever suits you best. Who is not tired cannot rest. The children applauded these beautiful lines, and Galopoff bowed very gravely, as a poet should. Then Christopher said, But that is as much as to say, leave well enough alone. Exactly, said Galopoff. Suppose we ask Gypsy what he thinks. So they called Gypsy over, and Helen asked him, which would you rather do, Gypsy? Stay here or go out into the world again and have exciting adventures? Galopoff wants to know. East or west, home is best, said Gypsy, and scampered back to his master. He's right, said Galopoff. The end. End of section 20 End of Gypsy the Talking Dog A Story for Young Folks by Tudor Jenks